comments. Hi, hello. My name is Harlow Holmes. Um, I am the Director of Digital Security at Freedom of the Press Foundation. And uh, today I'm going to give a talk called Tip Lines Today. Um, it's uh, the culmination of a, uh, a lot of research that I've been doing, working with journalists um, as they uh, interact primarily with whistleblowers, leakers, and ultimately, like, you know, potential sources, uh, and also the public at large. And so uh, this this talk is going to be technical, but not so technical as some of the talks that you're going to see today, uh, simply because I, I feel that the best use of my time here, and I'm very happy to be here today, um, the best use of my time here is to give people a um, more of a theoretical and kind of a trade worky um, underpinning of what we're working with when we work with members of the press, especially those who work um, in serving the public interest. So, uh, first and foremost, I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction about Freedom of the Press Foundation. We are a nonprofit 501c3 organization based out of the United States, primarily the um, New York and San Francisco, uh, but we also have a number of people who work pretty much all over the globe, Canada, India, etc. And we are based of... Uh, in three parts. One is in software development. So you might have heard of a newsroom appliance that's called Secure Drop, which our engineering team maintains as a, you know, once again, a newsroom appliance, a little bit expensive, a little bit intensive, but it's uh, a piece of software and hardware that sits in a variety of newsrooms across the globe that from a technical perspective, I want you to remember that, a technical perspective, um, uh, enables uh, secure and anonymous communications between a potential whistleblower or a potential source and any particular newsroom. And this is just a sample of organizations that currently use it. Um, the second tier is advocacy. So you may have or may not have heard of the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker, which is a uh, advocacy campaign um, in conjunction with the Committee to Protect Journalists, CPJ, uh, that um, you know, employs in reporters who actually in go out and investigate um, uh, incidents where members of the press within the United States have uh, been prevented from doing their jobs, whether that means, you know, being arrested at an event that they're, they're um, covering, whether that means being assaulted at an event that they're covering, having devices confiscated, having um, people inspect their devices, etc., and the third tier is my tier, which is the digital security team. Um, I head up a small team where we provide digital security training, consulting, and security auditing for newsrooms, large and small, as well as media makers, so documentary filmmakers, and uh, people who do smaller things like podcasts, uh, you know, very, very small uh, batch organizations. But all of which, you know, comes together in order to like cover what we need for the press to win, uh, especially in today's climate globally, ultimately, which is, you know, the technology tools, the advocacy to ring the alarm when things are not going as it should, and giving people the tools that they need in order to um, uh, counter what I like to call the asymmetry of preparedness. And I'll get to that in a moment. So... <clears throat> All right, so really, really quickly, let's talk about digital security training and where it's gone over the past couple of years. I started at Freedom of the Press Foundation in 2005 as simply a trainer. Um, I have come from like, you know, a, a tool building background, a developer background, but I had spent so many, t uh, so much time in the field, uh, understanding how the best tools in the hands of people who are not prepared are not good at all. So, um, as I had gotten started, we started, you know, just doing like the simple stuff. And of course, because this is hack glue, I'm going to just very quickly skip over what the fundamentals look like. Encryption works. How does it work? Gosh, we tell people about oh, communication over HTTP versus HTTPS versus end to end encryption. These are all things that you know very, very well. And we're going to focus on signal, particularly um, at, a little bit later. 
We also talk to people about what we like to call the low hanging fruit, which is like, oh gosh, and uh, or sorry, two factor authentication, and why um, not all two factor authentication schemes are essentially equal. Um, of course, prioritizing things like the software token or the app and the hardware token, like a YubiKey or something like that. There you go. Um, we, uh, as far as like members of the press are concerned, we, when we're speaking to them in digital security trainings, we teach them to be available everywhere to potential sources. And so that means that, uh, different sources, you know, the public at large are going to have different comfort zones in terms of like what technology they can use in order to make that initial contact with a journalist. Some of these are safer than others, and we'll get to that in a moment. But that said, you do want to be accessible to sources everywhere that there that you can be available as long as there is a modicum of security and we also this is actually really really unique so um contrasting this to my work um, as a tool builder working with NGOs and things like that, um, there's a really, really effective um, like extra uh, benefit that you get with working with members of the press, and that is you can leverage them in order to increase herd immunity. So, uh, for instance, yeah, Tor wouldn't be so suspicious if more people use Tor, right? And so we actually encourage members of the press to use their platforms as journalists to evangelize. Um, and this is the first line of attack in order to counter what I like to call the asymmetry of preparedness. And I'm going to return to this a couple of times uh, as we speak together. So what this means on the digital security training front is like, actually, you can see this in how the press starts to do its job. Um, I did not personally like whisper in anyone at Motherboard's ear about this, but around the same time that digital security training became more and more popular, you also started to see features that would be in mainstream media, such as the Motherboard Guide to Not Getting Hacked, which which actually contained a lot of the information that digital security trainers would parachute into newsrooms and in, in part on those train um, on those journalists. And so you started to see like a really really great opportunity for um, digital security to make its way into like you know just kind of general um, consumption of media through members of the press. I was actually on the Christmas episode of uh, Cyber, which is Motherboard's podcast, um, where uh, I got to uh, spout a lot of expletives as I talked about, you know, the dangers of having an Alexa in the home. But um, I think that this is like a really, really cool, uh, just um, A to Z example of how that type of mechanism works. You also have started to see over the past, you know, year or so, maybe two years, a number of what are called tip line pages uh, that are usually on um, uh, available from any mainstream newspapers websites, where they instruct people on how to send in tips and how to communicate with journalists via a couple of very, very like um, common, increasingly common media. Uh, the first being email. You'll also see Signal and WhatsApp because they want to promote end-to-end -end encryption rather than having conversations over the telephone because of the dangers of metadata and the lessons learned about metadata in, and its use in um, um, persecuting members of the press uh, and their sources. So... The secure contact pages, um, if you were going to give any takeaways, this is actually what we advise members of the press, specifically when we do consulting. Um, first and foremost, obviously, you know, you have to have uh, HTTPS on your landing page. That's, you know, kind of... Uh, the first step, obviously. Uh, you want to make sure that people can speak to their IT departments or whoever manages their, their content management system or CMS regarding ads and tracking. Um, this might be a page where you absolutely like restrict those uh, typical ads and trackers, the things that actually make money for uh, the news industry. Uh, you want to prevent them from having any reach there. Another thing that people don't necessarily think about is actually specialized domains, by which I mean um, it is 
highly unsafe for a news organization to have, hypothetically, leaks dot newyorktimes.com because of because of uh, DNS uh, lookups that actually reveal the fact that you've gone to that very, very specific subdomain and instead teaching people like you see in the ProPublica uh, instance to uh, add it as, you know, just part of the URL on an HTTPS protected site. So you get that out of DNS lookups. Um, another thing that we encourage people to do is to mirror this same content about how to contact members of the press via the commons of the internet. So that means, you know, like uh, things like Twitter and Facebook and even GitHub, other common platforms that don't necessarily leave incriminating logs in anyone's browser histories should um, that become part of an investigation because you absolutely never know what's going to happen. Um, we also teach people to a certain extent to plan for success as well as failure. And so success actually means that, uh, and I'll return to this as well towards the end, um, but uh, when you have a page on the internet, just the internet that people go to, and you say, hey, guess what? Like, call me anytime, send me whatever you want. I promise I'll answer the phone. I promise I'll open your attachments. You are asking for two Three, very, very specific problems. You are asking for um, stuff that wastes your time and abuses you. You are asking for malware. You are asking for um, a wildly inappropriate and often illegal uh, bits of like non-information. And we'll get into like the nuances of this a little bit later on. But we do teach people how to um, properly like, you know, craft a shutdown plan, which in the case of um, a lot of the tools that are in use, understanding that uh, uh, being able to, you know, entirely shut down um, a secure drop instance, meaning literally unplug it, meaning uh, know how to actually delete things off of a server before they enter into e-discovery is actually like a huge benefit and something that people need to learn. Um, we also teach them uh, strategies of decentralized so making sure that there's redundancy within a newsroom in order to cover uh, tip lines or tips as they come in. So uh, strategies for scheduling whose turn it is to check the secure drop or to check the WhatsApp or signal tip line um, and properly annotate that so it's usable within a newsroom. There's actually a lot of politics that surround um, who actually has access to tips, uh, who gets to see them first. Journalists are um, personally very competitive, not only within other people in their newsrooms, but obviously with other newsrooms. And so you have this intra and extra, you know, curricular kind of competition that you might be aware of. Um, and uh, also setting expectations regarding what the difference between confidentiality and anonymity are and giving journalists the tools to both on a philosophical, uh, a legal, and a technical level unpack all those things. I'm going to get to that again later on. Okay, so let's pick apart what they're doing wrong. I'm not actually going to um, malign any of the journalists that I work with. They're all really amazing and all of these newsrooms, no matter what their budget is, no matter how large they are, are doing excellent creative things with the tools that we have at hand. And the problem is with the tools, not with these people. Email sucks. You all know this. So yeah, we let's go through like 2013 Snowden uh, revelations, SSL added and removed here, which made <laughs> the, um, you know, just like uh, any attempt to actually email someone over what you thought was a secure TLS protected channel kind of a lie. Uh, the fact that there are back, like, uh, infrastructure for permanent back doors that are totally shielded from the entire development team, save, you know, like a, like a quorum of like a couple of folks who know the dirty secret. Great. Uh, phishing, obviously. We all know what happened to John Podesta. Um, and the fact that there's just rampant, rampant, um, uh, mistakes that actually leave, uh, you know, email, uh, 
open to hackers and intelligence agencies alike. Not even to mention the fact that we're starting to see, as of a couple of months ago, if not earlier, uh, DNS attacks on popular mail servers, which means that this entire thing is untrustworthy. And so, of course, what people do in order to create a tip line that's based off of email uh, is to encourage people to use PGP, um, pretty good privacy, usually by your GPG, client of choice. Um, PGP, a minute to learn, a lifetime to master. Uh, I'm sure there's plenty of folks in the audience who are familiar with how to use PGP, but you also know that like one accidental, you know, like early morning before the coffee reply all without encrypting the message actually reveals the entire chain. That's just one example. Um, there's also the metadata question that is never, ever going to be addressed through um, uh, using email in general. So the very fact that people think that they can, you know, use their personal Gmail account in order to email ProPublica while using PGP keeps them anonymous is actually very erroneous. Um, and so, and also there's no perfect forward secrecy. Uh, Last year, there was the e-fail bug, um, which was a culmination of a variety of uh, problems within uh, popular PGP clients, that, or sorry, GPG clients, rather, um, that uh, would degrade um, the... Uh, uh, degrade PGP to such a way that like a maliciously crafted email could possibly send out uh, confidential information within that email to an attacker's um, at their choosing. And what's bad about that is that, I mean, like, obviously, um, other than, you know, the various flaws in these clients, but it underscored the idea that perfect forward secrecy um, and the lack of perfect forward secrecy, I will be giving like a little bit of a definition in a moment, for those of you who don't know. Um, but ultimately, it's kind of like the sword of Damocles uh, around PGP. The fact that in the near future, our 4,096-bit keys may be compromised and uh, every bit of email, encrypted email that has been hanging out in servers owned by intelligence agencies across the globe in the event that they can decrypt it will then kind of break that what we thought was secure cloud and let it all rain down. And that's actually a really, really scary prospect. But that said, people continue with email. And so we have um, uh, Proton Mail. I'm sure people have heard of Proton Mail. Uh, it is a Swiss-based email provider that adds PGP kind of automatically. Uh, it comes in its browser form um, by going to you know like mail.pgp or protonmail.com or via its app. Um, it's a really really excellent product, and it gained a lot of traction very early on with um, potential whistleblowers who felt like that was the email solution for them to contact members of the press because of encryption. However, there was a very dangerous um, uh, incongruency in messaging, meaning that a lot of ProtonMail users had absolutely no clue that if you are a ProtonMail user and you email someone who is, whose newsroom is backed by Google's, you know, enterprise G Suite or by Outlook or something like that, you do not get any kind of extra, you know, encryption in this, uh, in this communication. Um, and so th this kind of failure in messaging, um, with the public at large actually does lead to, once again, a horrible, horrible failure, um, uh, as far as members of the press's ability to protect communications with sources. There's also Tutanota, which is similar, another end-to-end -end encrypted email option that is once again gaining traction, more uh, popular with the NGO crowd right now, but uh, still gaining a lot of popularity. And actually what's interesting is that Tutanota um, has a pretty cool project that they have in beta called Secure Connect, which allows anyone to create a white label service um, 
that um, with a subdomain, right, subdomains, uh, with a subdomain allows them to create a portal from which anyone can um, have a email, a randomly generated email address hosted by your domain, on your whitelist, uh, sorry, white label domain um, that they can return to uh, that will enable this Tutanota protected end-to-end -end encrypted uh, conversation, which is a really, really cool project because it simplifies, you know, the very act. But quite frankly, we are talking, we're, this all falls down to DNS. So if I have, you know, submit leaks.propublica.org, which is backed by Tutanota, that does not at all address the DNS um, uh, issue. And unless you're actually going to teach people how to spin up Firefox in order to enable uh, DN uh, sorry, DNS over HTTPS or use the Tor browser or whatever, um, the, if you're not making that leap in education, you still fail. So, and also then, you know, people are just like, all right, well, let's, let's just use Mailvelope, um, which is a really excellent excellent uh, uh extension for Chrome and Firefox, which shoehorns PGP into uh, your web-based client of choice, whether that's Gmail or um, mail.de or Outlook. But uh, have you, if you've ever tried to use Mailvelope on Outlook, you will know the pain and you really, really might um, become kind of like consumed by FUD. I guess, or sorry, fear, uncertainty, and doubt that it's actually working. So once again, the asymmetry of preparedness rears its head once again between sources and uh, uh, journalists. Email sucks. Email is evil. And yet this is kind of the first step for anyone who is not 100% ready to become like a whistleblower, but is just kind of testing the waters. And so we have to remind people that shoehorning in end-to-end -end encryption via PGP enables not anonymity, but confidentiality. And there is a huge difference between the two, and it takes a lot of work to manage people's expectations on both sides about what those mean. So then we go to what's easier now than PGP. And actually, um, I can say from uh, not only anecdotally, but also uh, through um, a, a lot of surveying that I've done with journalists that I work with, they would just like rather use their phone so, of course, they're on, you know, all of the end-to-end -end encrypted apps, and we teach them, this is where we give them the tools to kind of understand what this means, right? So, this is where we go through, I'm just going to breeze through this, because we all know what it is, uh, the content, what's being said, the metadata, which is, right, the who, it actually taking from the journalist parlance, because they respond to this really well, the who, when, where, how, um, that, uh, uh, of the conversation, which includes, you know, people's names and handles and things like that, but also things that people are less attuned to, to noticing, such as their IP addresses, um, their phone numbers and like, you know, other errata that gets picked up really well by computers and picked up really well by investigators, but not necessarily by humans. Um, we teach them about what is absolutely a must-have in that you must have a system that includes at least encryption in transit and encryption at rest, right? So you want to make sure that that app um, is a good faith app that properly sandboxes its data uh, in a responsible way and uses key storage in order to manage um, access to it, uh, gives you controls that are probably linked to, you know, like identity properties on the device in order to access it, and obviously encryption in transit. Obviously, um, another must-have, or sorry, these are nice to have, unfortunately, um, which is end-to-end -end encryption, which in my case, or sorry, in my opinion, should be a must-have, but that's not always the case. Uh, you know what end-to-end -end encryption is. Um, less, uh, we're seeing less and less, um, or sorry, we're seeing, we are seeing perfect forward secrecy, uh, 
secrecy in a subset of applications that also provide end-to-end -end encryption. So that would be Signal, but it would not be WhatsApp. Um, that would be, for a variety of reasons, uh, <laughs> that would now be like Keybase and Wire, but it didn't used to be, and they're just starting to adapt to it. Um, that would not be Snapchat, although people think, uh, people think it does because people often confuse perfect forward secrecy with just disappearing messages. Um, we also would love to have plausible deniability, um, but there are very, very few um, applications out there that can reliably provide that. And the reason is not technical, not only technical, but it's maybe 70% technical and 30% just logistical, um, how these apps are actually used in people's hands, especially given the fact that... Um, you might have an application that provides plausible deniability and perfect forward secrecy, but um, if it's linked to a telephone number, then, you know, to an investigator, it doesn't really matter. Um, if it's logged in an iCloud or a Google Drive account, it doesn't really matter. So instead, what we do is, and... Apologies in advance to any of my friends um, who have seen this a million times, but this is my favorite thing, and I think it's important, uh, is to teach people, rather than to use a tool, uh, to teach them a methodology for um, evaluating tools, because you're going to have to, uh, throughout your career as a journalist, communicate with people on a variety of different platforms. And today, Signal might be here, but tomorrow, Signal may be gone. And so in that case, you have to teach people a methodology of evaluating tools. On our y-axis, we have, you know, the vertical one, we have what actually does the job well, what ticks off all the boxes, what provides end-to-end -end encryption, uh, what uh, has a respectable relationship to metadata, um, meaning that, you know, they're not sitting on months and months and months of uh, what are called uh, message pairings, meaning like who talked to whom. It doesn't matter who said it. Like we don't care what they said. It's just who talked to whom at what time. Um, all of these things. Uh, also design choices matter. Um, but on our y-axis, and this is actually a great place to contrast Signal and WhatsApp, um, both heavily in use in communication with sources. Uh, WhatsApp really, really does illustrate the importance of our our x-axis, our um, horizontal axis, because there are very, very, very many certain uh, situations where you, as much as you would love to go to Signal, you can't, um, and WhatsApp is just going to be the best choice. So once again, thinking about how well it protects a conversation, yes, WhatsApp has end-to-end -end encryption, the same end-to-end -end encryption as we would get within Signal. However, WhatsApp being owned by Facebook, um, their motivations and their access to people's devices are entirely different. Not only that, but like the fact that uh, up until a couple of months ago, WhatsApp would by default take all of those conversations and just throw them up unencrypted or differently encrypted into your iCloud. And so that kind of negates the, um, the, the idea of end to end encryption altogether. But when you take into account the fact that in order to have a conversation, um, people have to be on the same channel, meaning they have to be speaking the same language. You cannot tweet a WhatsApp message. You cannot Slack someone an email. You can't signal someone a TikTok video. Um, everyone has to be on the same channel. And if one channel is unavailable to one of the parties, then you are not going to have a conversation. And so um, there are a number of sources, primarily those who work in the MENA region, um, the Middle East and Northern Africa, uh, and parts of uh, Asia and things like that, who uh, rely on uh, WhatsApp because that's what's available to people there. 
And also, in the case of, let's say, people who are, you know, um, are currently uh, covering Syria, uh, knowing that speaking, communicating with a source on an app like Signal might get your source thrown in jail or worse. Whereas if you look over the shoulder of anyone in that area, they're all using WhatsApp. That provides you a lot of cover despite the trade-offs that you have to make regarding the metadata. So like metadata is a first world problem in that regard. Similarly, we talk about Facebook Messenger. Um, I uh, like to throw Facebook Messenger out there because, I mean, it's Facebook, but it does provide a secret chat function. Um, these are the black chats versus the purple chats. Uh, but the problem with Facebook Messenger, in addition to what we already highlighted with WhatsApp, is that um, with Facebook Messenger, you find yourself, um, or certain sources actually find themselves a little bit confused about how to enable the the secret chats what's the difference between secret chat and um you know the regular uh uh end to end in, or sorry uh rather regularly encrypted chats. And having that confusion in how to use a product actually gets people in danger, primarily because, you know, they're having a chat and then they'll switch to Facebook on desktop, let's say, and then um, get themselves into trouble because all of a sudden your end-to-end uh, -end encrypted communications come tumbling out into the not into the clear, but into something that Facebook can see and something that Facebook can ultimately um, produce should there be a subpoena, warrant, or order of production, or whatever your country likes to call it, um, as long as people aren't using SMS messages. And I think we all know why, right? Um, so people are really, really, really into their phones. It makes their jobs easier as journalists. And um, if you've ever worked in a newsroom, you might know that everything works on a very tight clock. Um, if you do not go to print tomorrow, then you might not get another assignment. You might um, be scooped by someone else in your newsroom. Some other paper might take your story and run with it. So you are always moving. And actually, the mobile phone makes it incredible incredibly, incredibly um, easy to do this type of work. So, but that said, um, your mobile phone is an extension of yourself, um, regardless of, you know, our social security numbers, our identity cards, our passports. Our phones are actually like an equally unique identifier uh, about ourselves as human beings. And so I'll kind of illustrate what this means. I pick on motherboard a lot because I love them. They're great. Um, <laughs> but you take Lorenzo Franceschi Bicchieri and Joseph Cox, two great, great cyber reporters um, at motherboard. And uh, if you look at, you know, they're following all of those tips about like be available everywhere. Like, yeah, you can hit me up on Jabber and on Signal, um, you know, and all the cool kids stuff. Um, but but just the um, the vulnerability of offering your phone number on a public platform like Twitter, which is accessible to any person on the planet, and expect for any person on the planet to at any moment just call you on the phone that you carry in your back pocket, that actually... Um, from a personal perspective for a lot of journalists, is incredibly unequal. Unequal. Uh, once again, I love these journalists and have the utmost of respect for them. But there is a very, very gendered perspective regarding how well this works. So uh, a couple of years ago, Jillian York actually rang this alarm uh, Jillian York, a technologist at EFF who works on advocacy issues, talked about the very fact that, like, you know, it's for some people, it's really not desirable or even possible, definitely not safe to let every person on earth call you on your phone. Signal notwithstanding. And so, um, within this field, uh, women, 
people of color, women of color, ultimately are the canaries in the coal mine regarding privacy and security issues. And if there's anything that I would love for you to kind of take away today, in addition to like all of this other stuff, please do keep that in mind. Um, and as canaries in the coal mine, we started to kind of like, you know, kind of find ways to have our cake and eat it too. So, uh, if you want to have like a burner signal number, yeah, you can get like a burner SIM or whatever, top it off for like 40 bucks a month. Who wants to do that? Or you could get a virtual number by using a service like, let's say, Twilio or um, MySudo or, you know, something like that. Um, so, this actually kind of works really well with very, very little configuration. You can buy a burner phone number that is VoIP only, associate that with your real phone number. And by doing so, you know, do things like bootstrap yourself onto Signal. Um, there, however, oh, it used to work, but then because uh, criminals really ruin everything that we do, um, it stopped working. Uh, if you look up any kind of number, you'll notice that, you know, carrier types actually matter. And so in order to cull um, a rash of spam and fraud, uh, services like WhatsApp actually stopped honoring um, uh, voice over IP phone numbers uh, in order to bootstrap onto the service, which was like a huge problem. Uh, as signal is a little bit better, but okay, this is actually, this is a picture of the phone, the, the phone that is outside of, um, uh, the train station at Bletchley Park, right outside of London, the, uh, uh, birthplace of modern computing to a certain extent. And I tried to get this as a signal number, but it did not work because this is registered as a landline. There are workarounds though. Um, I'm not going to talk about this in front of the camera, but there are workarounds, but they're incredibly difficult. And quite frankly, it's a game of whack-a-mole. And we notice that like our windows for opportunity are slowly closing for tactics like this. Um, and so this is why like actually just having a friend who works at Twilio or works at WhatsApp and getting them to champion your cause is kind of the best thing we can do. Um, another thing is about uh, the distributed nature of Signal and WhatsApp and other um, uh, applications such as this. So, like, usually... Uh, when someone is using Signal on their phone, they are also using Signal on desktop, which has its own unique sets of problems, especially when you're working in a newsroom, whether you're at a small organization or a large one. So Signal and desktop is actually kind of gutsy. I mean, a couple of years ago, we actually, uh, or there was a report that came out regarding the fact that, you know, even though you have end-to-end -end encryption within Signal for desktop, but also you have notifications that get placed in a separate database that are forensically searchable. And so if you're not properly minding where those databases are and where the logging is and where your growl no notifications go, then you're actually like, you know, do doing the same thing as iCloud. You're taking what was an end-to-end -end encrypted conversation and you're plopping it somewhere easily accessible for anyone. Um, also, within large enterprises, you'll uh, actually find that a lot of people don't even have full disk encryption on their laptops because their IT department hates them, and uh, they don't allow them to do that. Also, remote desktop is a huge problem. Um, people might, uh, you might communicate, well, not maybe not you, but like a, imagine being a source communicating with a journalist under what you think is complete anonymity, and then um, uh, realizing that because your computer or the journalist's computer is remote administered by the IT department, that entire conversation is exposed. So um, there's also other things like uh, people who are like a little bit hackery within newsrooms um, try to do some cool stuff regarding um, uh, command line uh, tools that also leverage the Signal API, such as Signal CLI, which is by a gentleman named uh, ASAM K, and Signal D, whose uh, name I forget, the Fin 93. Okay. Uh, there's also the uh, Center for Digital Resilience's project in co, um, uh, or like co work 
working with the Guardian Project uh, in order to create a uh, Rust-based um, Signal CLI client that is called Cigarillo. Uh, my colleague Parker Higgins is actually working on a Tor-based uh, um, package that leverages, you know, Signal on the de- uh, on CLI called Tuttle, which actually is good for like distributed teams because you know uh, there are challenges. Um, but that said, like there's so many problems there. Uh, Moxie, Marlon Spike, the developer of Signal, the founder of Signal himself is actually like really worried about people's rogue use of his API. But what can you do? It's open source. And, you know, I mean, everyone encourages um, experimentation. Um, but still, like, attachments, disappearing messages, something called sealed senders, which actually, like, protect metadata between conversation parties a little bit more, work best on the phone than they do on the desktop. And unfortunately, like, this is leaving gaping holes. Um, sometimes you get yourselves into situations where instead of having end-to-end encryption, you're just having point-to-point-to-point-to-point encryption. And if you're a purist... Um, as the Signal developers definitely are, um, that's problematic. And also, you're on Java, so... And also, uh, Checkmate happened. Uh, This was actually groundbreaking, um, just because in order to, like, uh, there's a very big tension in tip lines because people are um, very... uh, what they want to do is they just want to grab like a cheap iPhone, spin up signal, stick it in a skiff or something like that, and, uh, you know, like check their messages. But now, because of Checkmate, we have a whole bunch of phones out there that are 100% um, vulnerable to the not necessarily inevitability, but the possibility that someone might storm into your office and take your phone. So uh, that said, yeah, so if somebody takes your phone, uh, it's game over. Uh, bearing parallel construction, meaning that all of these systems are broken and the encryption doesn't work and my entire life has been a lie, um, and in which case I guess I'll tell you, maybe. Um, but ultimately people are just taking what it is that they see. <laughs> Come on. Oh, you can't even hear that. I didn't prepare that. Okay, so it's from Where in the World is Carmen San Diego when they get the warrant. Um, ultimately, like, if you get a warrant from someone's phone, um, then uh, this enters into discovery, and it, the end-to-end encryption does not matter at all. Um, in certain... Ooh, five? Oh, gosh. I've been talking a while. All right, sorry about that. What's <laughs> sure? Um, okay, so I'll, I'll kind of blaze through this. Uh, so um, they can, you know, when your phone enters into e-discovery, your legal team actually has to help people um, navigate even the end-to-end encrypted conversations that you have. And we've started to see this um, frequent, like more and more frequently, um, as uh, end-to-end encryption just becomes something that prosecutors have to work with. Uh, there's also, you know, like the uh, the metadata and other errata and other stuff that gets generated in using these things on a phone. So uh, iMessages, end-to-end encrypted, right? But also, like, you know, the metadata such as presence information um, does not actually say who's talking to one another, but like in ensemble, they can actually reveal quite a story. And so we get back to the asymmetry of preparedness again, where ultimately what you just say, like, if you're covering national security, don't use WhatsApp. And also, like check out the settings for all of that extra metadata and other stuff that we were talking about. Um, Ultimately, like it's a very, very uneven game. Um, I was going to take a philosophical break to talk about Foucault's boomerang, which is the idea from uh, the 20th century French philosopher where uh, tools of a colonizing power that are built and fine-tuned to command and control a colonized population will inevitably return to the hands of the architect to be used against the people, um, their, their fellow people. 
And I draw on this not because like I want it to be, you know, doom and gloom or anything like that, but the uh, role of tools like Signal and Tor and all of these things um, are, are uh, like actually evolutionary in that like can uh, Signal and Tor were invented in order to um, address uh, problems in other countries regarding censorship and circumvention and confidentiality and the fact that you might receive the P-tape on your phone and then call your mom and then call an Uber is not something that Moxie Marlin, Marlin Spike intended. Um, so ultimately, Secure Drop, a necessary plug for this. Um, which is kind of the closest we have to um, uh, true anonymized communications between sources and journalists. Finally, I'll talk a little bit about um, our next frontier here. Uh, so, as I said, um, uh, whistle or sorry, journalists who talk to whistleblowers are really asking for malware. Um, uh, inappropriate images and also just like a whole bunch of um, uh, other things that like just make the entire project feel 100% powerless and, and worthless. Um, so we're trying to do things that like kind of uh, help them out there. Um, so we have a um, uh, an organizational security auditing um, program that's, you know, getting off of its feet uh, that addresses the specific needs of uh, journalists at a variety of newsrooms, uh, or sorry, at a newsrooms of a variety of sizes. Um, <clears throat> cool. Uh, Ultimately, uh, the reason why is because unlike regular, you know, penetration testing and, and other services like that, the field specific and cultural needs need to be folded into engagements with those clients. Um, they, uh, empathy, inclusion, and sustainability and self-sufficiency are actually what we um, uh, prioritize, um, not only cost, simply because um, organizations actually like can't necessarily afford the extra step of, um, you know, having someone come in and fix their problems for them. They actually have to be given the tools in order to get most of that legwork done themselves. So uh, ultimately what we use in order to do that is safe tag. That's one thing. Thing, um, which is an internews project that is like the premier framework for organizational security auditing and is incredibly accessible to people without certification. We also uh, employ human design thinking um, uh, exercises, which actually gets people engaged and helps you, or sorry, it helps them help you do the audit in order to um, encourage them to think through certain like problems and challenges they have and imagine solutions. And, uh, you know, ultimately, like, you know, we, we definitely like in map your network and, and all those things. Um, but it's not a full on penetration test. Um, we target uh, a variety of like, you know, different, uh, uh, Tar uh, yeah, different aspects of security, which I think is probably um, uh, known to everybody here regarding, you know, like the A to Z of anyone's particular security in a, in a newsroom. And uh, through preparation, which includes need finding, um, these types of on-site uh, uh, prodding, as well as observations, interviews, and asset discovery. Uh, it also includes uh, digital security training that is actually targeted to holes that we've perceived in the newsrooms that we can um, successfully patch. And then um, helping people uh, like come to like more effective um, protocols within their newsrooms that they can apply going forward. So uh, we use cubes. I like love to, cubes is a perfect tool for this type of thing um, for a variety of reasons. I won't get into it because this is the end of my time. Uh, but if you want to talk about any of the slides that you see, uh, please do find me. And ultimately like that helps us combat hopefully this asymmetry of preparedness uh, because because the tools aren't all um, without like a successful methodology um, and uh, like a, a, a tactic not only to discuss tools but also education and advocacy, um, we were lost. Um, and so that's the state of the press. I don't think I have time for questions, but I am here. Oh, I do. Okay. All right. So I do have time for some questions if there are any. Um, uh, and otherwise, 
Uh, special thanks to people who helped Hello. me come to this research. Sorry about that. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thank you for your talk. I have a question about the Telegram. You haven't mentioned it in the list, so I just want to ask you why. Because it's, uh, you know, there are lots of messages from Pavel Durov, the creator, about the WhatsApp and why Telegram is better, everything. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, questions interested. about Telegram. Um, I didn't include Telegram in my matrix there because uh, Telegram is less popular in the United States than it is out here. Um, however, Telegram is definitely something to address. Uh, so uh, I tend to believe that the end-to-end -end encryption within Telegram's person-to-person, one-to-one chats is sound, and I, I definitely hope that that is. Um, I know that there are conflicting ideas uh, regarding that. Um, but I will leave that to others. Uh, I definitely do know that um, from a design perspective, or sorry, from a messaging and design perspective, there are, um, it's the same as, you know, Facebook Messenger in that there is a lot of like, questions about where a conversation is end-to-end -end protected and where it is not, where it's just regular uh, encrypted. And so without that type of education, then you set people up to fail. So that's first and foremost. Um, I also think that like a lot of the mythology surrounding the Telegram team is a little bit of security theater. And uh, that is like, you know, crafted in order to build up this mythos and in order to um, uh, inspire more confidence in the product. But that said, like, you know, uh, we'll let the, the shoes drop as they drop. Okay, any more questions from the floor? I have one one question myself, yes. which is something um, dealing. Uh, you you explained a lot there about dealing with newsrooms and dealing about investigative journalists and and such, but uh, regular journalists, journalists that are not uh, investigative journalists who are not in that kind of field, uh, how how easy or difficult is it to get them to uh, adapt some of these techniques and to what extent are they actually a risk to the other journalists that are doing this stuff? That's a really good question and I would say that there are three answers to it. One is that um, uh, confidentiality is reciprocal. And so you do want to foster an environment in which everyone is like, you know, as mindful of one another's privacy and uh, hope to have confidentiality as possible. Um, another is like the fact that a lot of people have had this mindset of, um, I have nothing to hide. I don't work a beat that's important. I work the real estate beat. I work the sports beat. I work the whatever. Um, I would say that you never know what's going to happen. I mean, the very, very idea that someone who works the real estate beat actually might be sitting on, you know, like evidence of uh, corruption regarding like, you know, um, people buying properties in cash that belongs to a mafia. Like, I mean, you never know exactly what's going to happen. Football leaks, like that it was, that's an incredibly huge story, but that comes like, that's something that would be like on the sports desk and they never really think of themselves as part of that action. Um, so you never know where it's coming from. Um, and the third bit about that, um, is, yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, some, actually, someone had said, like, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to teach us how to be spies? And I'm like, no, I'm trying to teach you how to do your job. Like, confidentiality is a requirement of the job. Okay, great. Thank you very much.